Hello and welcome back. Happy Monday, everyone. Uh, you guys wanted some more coverage of Guild of Destiny as well as my thoughts on it. Uh, this is a Victorian era game that is going to be a grand strategy game. Uh, it looks quite a lot like a very ambitious version of Vic 2 or kind of Vic 3 uh, based on our early kind of first three dev diary to take a look at. And so we're going to be looking at it more today. Specifically, we're going to be looking th through Dev Diaries 3 through Dev Diaries 5. Dev Diary 3 is on logistics. Dev Diary 4 is on trade. And Dev Diary 5 is a special vlog on which we know not what but it appears to be at least something to do with the map but we'll get to it when we get to it and so without further ado let's get to it uh so far, starting with logistics greeting and salutations happy monday today we bring you the next step diary and introductions to the logistics systems now to be uh to be honest i think logistics should be more of a factor in victoria 3 um this would be really sweet my understanding is that it increases the number of calculations and this is the primary um inhibit uh inhibition for having something that would be uh, you know, calculate how far a good is traveling in order to determine, like, its sell price and this type of thing, because I think this is an important type of consideration, especially in the case of something like a canal, uh, tariffs going through the canals, this type of stuff. So, um, excited to be reading this logistics one. The development of fast and efficient global transportation networks revolutionized international trade and economic integration. Also, we're reading a book on industrialization, and it's very cool how in the early, like, uh, in the mid-early 1800s, like, the UK exported a ton of goods, and they were, like, a goods leader, and then they started not being so good at exporting the goods, especially the other industrial countries, and instead what they uh, exported was a lot of financing and uh, freight, which is to say that they transported a lot of goods for other countries, um, and this was their primary kind of um role on the main stage in the late 1800s so let's continue with this though uh, there's like nothing to simulate that in Vic 3 this logistical advancement provided a catalyst for both the expansion and deepening of industrialization the most potent historical example is the British Empire which dominated industry and transportation networks by land by sea and during the industrial revolution the empire grew to such an extent that colonies around the globe led the maxim the sun never sets on the British Empire in this inner uh, weaving of industrialization transportation and logistics uh, that we hope to simulate with Guild of Destiny. Uh, in Guild of Destiny, you will be able to construct logistics networks on land and water. No transportation of goods by air was not realistically possible yet during the 19th century. Boo, no zeppelins. Okay. In order to grow your country, you will need to use a combination of these modes of transportation, land, river, and sea. By linking these routes uh, and coordinating logistics across your empire with other nations, your economy and society will flourish. And we have logistics buildings. So we have here, this is a freight terminal. We see it's got laborers and clerks. It's got road and railroad. And so I'm guessing it's gonna provide both, or this is, it's got routes through both and it's connected. We see severed, we see length. Monthly transit, 8.8K. So I guess that's the amount that's going through it. Um, the transport capacity, we see the capacity here and the previous month that's going through it. Uh, monthly transit, and so we see a system where we are going to care a lot about sending goods to various places, which is going to create, you know, um, we have in Victoria 3, we have uh, vertical integration through the MAPI system, but it's only applied to that single state. And so if you just go move one state over, um, you know, you have to pay the full price of transportation of the good relative to if you sent it to the complete other side of the globe, which really hurts countries um, like the Ottoman Empire, which don't have places with both coal and iron adjacent in the exact same state or they don't have it in the exact same state and instead they're just like in adjacent states which would be um you know good enough okay the first item in our logistical chain is the discussion of logistics buildings they are a special class of buildings built and operated by the state only provinces um this is interesting do they have to be built and there were toll roads Okay, but sure. Uh, only provinces with logistics buildings will possess the ability to transport goods to the outside world. Perfect. The position of logistics buildings on the map will dictate trade routes and lo uh, logistical supply routes, which will flow from one logistics building to the next. When trade occurs, goods will use the logistics routes to find their destination. In the picture of the bu uh, above, all routes connected to it can be viewed in the panel of logistics building. Logistics buildings will, are divided into three categories, land, river, and sea logistics. Cool. Freight and terminals, uh, cool to have the river one in particular. Uh, freight terminals will serve as logistical uh, needs on that land. River points will serve as interlays, uh, 
as inland uh, waterways, and seaports will serve as a logistical requirement for oceanic transport. Uh, freight terminals will allow you to construct roads and railways. Rivers ports will allow the establishment of transportation uh, uh, routes for inland waterways, and uh, seaports can establish uh, routes for oceanic transportation. In order to create a route in your logistics network, at least two logistics buildings of the same type must be constructed. A province can support all three types of logistical buildings at one time. Okay, so we're going to be, you know, we bring them in by sea, and then we bring them in by river and this type of thing. For example, a province located in a coastal estuary may reasonably possess a freight terminal, a river port, and a seaport. This seems especially important because every single, you know, uh, initial uh, point or every single river port, I imagine you will also want uh, a freight terminal for land, right? Um, as it like goes in through the river and go will branch out, branch out. Okay. Uh, freight terminals must be built on land, yet each uh, province can support only one, can only support one. Interesting. I guess you upgrade the level. River ports must be built along the shores of rivers flowing through the same territory, whereas seaports may be build, built on the coastline with access to the ocean. At the same time, uh, where you place the river ports and seaports will be limited by geographical factors, which is simulate real-world restrictions on the placement and feasibility of proposed sites. I assume you can't build a freight terminal in the middle of the ocean as well. Uh, regardless of the number of logistical buildings buildings in one province, goods are considered to have reached their destination when they reach any one of the buildings in a province. Any one of the buildings in a province. Any one of any building or any one of the freight building? Okay, in any case. Uh, at the beginning of the game, this, uh, some basic logistics buildings will still exist on the map appropriate for the economics and logistics network used during the 19th century. However, in the early stages of the game, you'll need to manually build and upgrade some additional logistics buildings to strengthen your economy and logistics network. So one concern I have for both this, um, the dev diaries I've seen so far for this game is that it seems like it might become a micromanagement nightmare, even if the game performance can work fully. But at the same time, logistics is real important. And so um, I would like a system that can grow organically as well, but okay. In addition, uh, logistics buildings will uh, need workers to ensure that logistic and transportation services run at full capacity. We'll go into the details about the labor demands below. Also, like, uh, the state... I feel like the state was not the primary investor in railroads in Great Britain. Um, I think it was uh, private construction. But I guess if you're going to control where it goes, it looks like we have some sort of... I don't know if this is a riverway or a regular road. I think that this is a riverway, and then this is a roadway, kind of snaking through various places, and then we have some sea connections, and okay, provinces are connected. Interesting that a province appears to be several tiles. Um, we see that here. Oops, where's my... Okay, we'll worry about that later. But a province seems to be several hexagonal tiles, so um, that's a little bit more of a clue as well for us. And so if you connect to anything in the province, you connect to the entire province, according to what they said earlier. And so you just need to get into the province at all. Very interesting. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, transportation routes uh, will connect logistics of buildings across the globe, thus forming global logistics network. This huge network contains four types of transportation routes. Road, river, uh, road, rail, ri river, and sea routes. And different transportation routes can be mixed and matched to complete uh, ultra-long distances trade across oceans and continents. It's important to remember that transportation services are not free. The total cost of transport will depend on the type and length of the route used, which this, this type of thing very much uh, a deeper portion of the simulation completely lost by Mappy. Mappy doesn't care whether you go one province over or the complete other side of the globe. Same, uh, globe, same cost. When goods move along the logistics network, they will always take the route with the t lowest total cost. Perfect. Shipping over water, whether by river or sea, is often the cheapest option. Uh, in either case, you may w be limited by natural conditions uh, affecting its... Man, do we have to put these two words together? Please never put affecting its effectiveness together. I just feel like that's a, like, crime. I mean, it's not grammatically incorrect. They, it's correct. Uh, they should say changing its effectiveness, alternating its effectiveness, but affecting its effectiveness. Ugh. Okay, especially with rivers, which must be deep, wide, and otherwise navigable. Land transport is usually the cheapest option to begin your logistics transportation network as, uh... 
roads and railroads can navigate most terrain. Railroads are going to be much more expensive. A lot of railroads were actually not very profitable. Uh, roads are the default uh, transport option. Once the road is established, they can provide uh, re uh, reliable connectivity between the r nodes of your network. Railroads must be built by you, however, and the cost of transportation will be greatly reduced relative to the roads. <sighs> you have to build the roads? The railroads? Not the capitalists? I don't think I like this in terms of a simulation. It's going to give you a lot more control. It's going to be a lot more micromanagement heavy, but this is not... Um, Capitalists built a lot of the railroads, but okay. Um, usually you will need to focus on land transportation routes, that is roads, uh, roads and railroads. Basic roads uh, exist between provinces by default in the game and they provide minimal transport connectivity. However, road transport is slower and more costly than other modes of transport. Slower is an interesting word as well, because okay, we're gonna have, stuff's gonna travel in a discreet way over, are we gonna have like, trade caravans or like monthly caravans or uh what does slower mean exactly so is it going to take six months to ship my goods across the ocean interesting okay building railroads railroads were developed and uh, reached widespread use in the 19th century therefore in order to construct rail conditions you must research railway technology first sure in addition upgraded freight terminals will be required to support the new ra rail network okay so we have some cost 10 million wood 10 million whatever ore this is labor cost which just shows a picture of a man and estimated time 542 days fair enough and where are we constructing this railroad maybe that's this here but okay you can construct railroads between provinces from the logistics panel pictured above by selecting the starting and ending points of the railway the two provinces with the yellow borders okay so it looks like we're looking at right here that's the railway the dotted one and so i guess this red one's probably also a railway maybe um, by selecting the starting and ending points of the railway, the two provinces with, with yellow border, the uh, game will automatically construct a railroad with the shortest length. Fair. Where, uh, where railroads are built in game depends on the terrain types of t the tiles, each of which has the specific properties that dictate the difficulty of laying tracks. This makes sense. Constructing railways on a mountain, swamp, and desert tiles, for example, require more financial investment and time to complete. Really? For the desert? Isn't the problem with the desert that it moves around more so than it's difficult to... Whatever. Um, also, tracks cannot be constructed between adjacent tiles with a height uh, difference greater than one, which includes a cliff. Makes sense. In addition, logistics buildings uh, have a transportation distance number, which limits the length of the railroads that the building could support. A higher level building will increase the transportation distance, allowing you to construct longer railroads. Okay. But won't we be constructing them to adjacent provinces, not province B to C. Okay, maybe that's not the case. Um, you could, could uh, the cost of undertaking is significant. You will need to, okay. Which, I forgot which paragraph we're on. In addition, as the game is real world, okay, military, okay. This is where we left off. Okay. In short, the game will automatically select an appropriate route for you to construct the railroad, which means you will ne not need to change the, uh, choose the exact route manually. I'm glad that this is not the case, because I think it would be tedious and there's probably just always one strictly best route. However, you will need to consider the strategic significance of the railroad. For example, how will this benefit the trade or the military in the game, as in the real world? Military units will also utilize the rail as transport and transportation networks. Therefore, in addition, uh, in addition to considering up Optimal trade routes, you may want to consider the strategic significance of a particular route. Cool. Uh, just like constructing a building, uh, railroads require materials and workers to complete construction. The cost of this undertaking can be significant, etc., which will likely put a strain on your national budget. See, it's... Okay, whatever. Uh, you con The state constructs the railroads. Uh, in order to effectively plan your railroad... I mean, that's not... <laughs> In order to effectively plan your railway, uh, your rail network without bankrupting your economy, you will need to balance the cost and benefit of each railway connection, placing them where they are mo uh, most uh, needed to maximize logistical efficiency. You know, it might be the case. So in Victoria 3, the state, uh, you spend almost all your money on construction, and it might be the case that you don't really spend money on regular construction, just infrastructure construction in this game, and that's kind of how you get to make your choices. Alternatively, you could start building a rail uh, network from any freight once it has reached a certain level. Okay. We see a logistics screen, uh, which is showing various seaports, it looks like. Uh, I guess the total amount of freight. 
uh, that is going through them. Uh, and total logistics income is an interesting one. Um, I guess the state will be getting paid because the state is building the, the freight stuff. Logistics networks op uh, operate automatically in your nation, collecting transport fees for fulfilling orders and delivering goods to the final destination. For your network to operate efficiently, you will not need to manage these things uh, directly in-game. Perfect. AI will manage uh, most tra uh, transshipment and logistical tax. However, all statistical... All statistics from your logistic networks will be compiled in the logistics panel pictured above to help you inform you how to develop your network further, such as investing where logistical efficiency is strained, upgrading buildings, or building additional railroad lines. Okay. Uh, transportation capacity will be one of the most important stats to keep an eye on while developing your logistical network. Transportation capacity is the measure of what percentage of your logistics network is being utilized. As this value approaches 100%, operations may become strained as resources, labor, and physical infrastructure reach their max capacity. However, uh, reaching 100% is also uh, is also an indicate indication. Uh, that your network needs an upgrade, uh, which will which you can do by upgrading uh, your logistics buildings. Failure to upgrade at this point will cause manufactured goods to get stuck and create a bottleneck, hurting your overall economy. Upgrading your buildings and networks will allow your increasingly prosperous industrial sector to reach the rest of your nation and uh, and the international mar markets. Okay. Other impacts. In addition to the impact on trade, transportation routes can also affect the trade routes and movement uh, speed of your army. As speed isn't critical for claiming success, transportation routes can be used for both logistics and trade in the military. Furthermore, moving uh, along established transportation routes can provide speed bonuses. For example, railways can bring obvious benefits when the army needs to move long distances. At the same time, your military can destroy the enemy's roads in order to interfere with their supply lines. I love this. Your military can uh, go after supply lines. In addition, we are considering how railroads affect the government control of a province, city, or local area and the government influence on those foreign countries. Although we are still brainstorming this, the increased connectivity of your nation will likely mean a greater flow of ideas and the means of enforcing the rule of law. Conclusion. In general... Uh, the mechanics of logistics are one of the foundations of Guild of Destiny. So far, they've said everything is a foundation, which, like, cheapens the, the thing. But also, it does seem pretty foundational. Uh, if most of your, you know, uh, brain energy, as it were, is spent on thinking where you're going to, how you're going to de develop your logistical network, such that certain areas can become more affluent, or you're going to emphasize certain areas or this type of thing, um, then... That'll be that'll be really cool. If you're like planning ahead to have a certain area become more developed, that'll be really cool. If it's just you playing whack-a-mole and responding to your industrialization, then that'll be less cool. But we'll see. You need to strike a, a delicate balance between maintain, uh, maintenance costs and comprehensive benefits by careful planning and the distribution of land, water, transport lines, uh, upgrading your levels of logistical buildings. While all is running smoothly in your logistics network, your whole country will thank you by running smoothly also. Again... I don't like that the state is owning all the railroads, but by default, uh, and it seems like always and forever, and, uh, but okay, I guess it's fine. All right, Dev Diary 4, trade, which trade should be very important, and is this Dev Diary very long? It looks relatively long. Okay, sure. So let's go through it. During the Industrial Revolution, an unprecedented amount of uh, products manufactured at never before, before seen efficiency and speed in high tech factories flooded the global market. The influx of manufactured goods on the economy led to an opening and deepening of larger markets. This is uh, a <laughs> opening, opening of deeper and larger markets. Okay, wait, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, trade networks, uh, communication, and capitalism across the world. Deepening trade uh, networks also. Oh, or allowed the access to these wider markets and informed a central role of the transformation into the modern era. Our focus today will be to how to re uh, realistically stimulate uh, simulate trade in Guild of Destiny. Trade has been one of the main engines for economies throughout human history, big yes, not to mention the exchange of ideas flowing along trade routes. Um, the richness offered by trade uh, networks far exceeds an exchange of between goods and money, leading to the rise and fall of nations, uh, exposure to new, new ideas and philosophies, the adaptation of technology and stroking human curiosity. I really want there to be a game that's about the spread of ideas. I think that'd be so cool. Uh, and it sounds like they want to capture some of that. Uh, on the transactional side, the exchange of money for goods uh, is determined by market forces such as supply and demand. As merchants seek to sell their goods, if a product sells very well, they will attempt to raise prices. However, consume, consumers have a limit on how much money they will... Okay, this is... 
equilibrium, etc., economics. So here we have a bit of a trade thing. Uh, it looks like we have prices, we have global trade priority, trade agreements, actions of others, it looks like import duty, embargo, adjust production, interesting, consumption tax is enabled, prioritize import in terms of tariffs, it looks like we can set, regional prices, we can see it's got, it's got a different price in a bunch of different places, um, and here we have production, import, export, unsold, unsatisfied, reserve. Okay, so we're gonna have all that reserve. It's an interesting one. There's a reserve of boats, we can see, which will be useful if you go to war, and uh, some of them get sunk, I suppose. Let's see, fish, we have a ton unsold, some exported, some imported, and a lot of production, that's interesting. It's fishies. Okay, price. To drive our industrial powerhouse, we often want the cheapest supply of goods and materials, yet we want to sell at the highest price on the world market. As discussed above, the market equilibrium will determine our prices at which we buy or sell goods and materials. We should note that several things can determine this equilibrium. In a free market, consumer demand and market supply will determine supply by the invisible hand of the market. However, if you, if you are an iron-fisted ruler controlling every aspect of your economy, you can, set, uh, you can first set the price that your economy is willing to pay for a particular good, and then, let's, and then supply will regulate itself accordingly. Price ceilings and price floors create efficiency in terms of economic theory, but uh, in addition, the price of a particular good or material can vary across the globe. For example, your country may have a naturally high occurring supply of coal, therefore coal may be inexpensive in your country and as you, uh, as you are able to extract and use it easily and cheaply. However, a neighboring country may have no uh, naturally occurring coal and will have to import its supply. Therefore, a coal-rich country, you may have a low domestic or local prices, but the international uh, price is much higher. As a result, your country would be incentivized to export coal and make profit. Okay. And di di disincentivized to import coal at a higher price. Buyers will always be willing to pay the uh, their province's domestic price for uh, goods and materials. Okay, sure. If the actual price exceeds the base price by a certain percentage, it'll be displaced in red. And so we see base price, domestic price, it's up by Five, transit capacity, I guess that's the amount that it costs per unit transported. No matter where the goods uh, come from, the buyers will uh, always buy them at the local price of the province. For example, lumber in uh, province A costs 10, and lumber in province B costs 7, so factories in province A buy it at, uh, uh, buy lum wait. Lumber in province A costs 10, lumber in province B costs 7. So factories in province A buy lumber in province B due to the higher price in province A. Province B could further benefit to uh, province A at a higher price than just selling internationally within the local province. It could further benefit from to province B could further benefit from to province A at a higher price. I assume that means selling to them. Uh, than just selling inter internally within their local province. Okay, sure, fair enough. And then we have a bunch of different prices in terms of the local one, but they'll try and buy them non-locally. Uh, and uh, so this will place demand on the infrastructure or the, coming back to this tab, the logistics, right? Okay, trade costs. Uh, trading in Gilded Destiny can largely be thought of as a series of point-to-point -point transactions that are determined by various factors, mainly log logistics costs and import-export tariffs, which will have an effect on price. Regarding the price of a commodity, when trading with other provinces, market transactions will be settled at the local price of the buyer's province. I wonder if this means it's going to settle, when moving trade, it's going to settle a new transaction at every single node. Um, the local price will be determined by various factors, including supply and demand. Any particular region on the map may be endowed with significant natural resources or manufacturing hub for a specialized commodity. For example, in a province that is a large uh, producer of leather, then the price would be higher. Uh, all units of leather were sold, indicating higher demand. Then price would be, high, would be higher. All units of leather were sold. In a province that is a large producer of leather, then prices would be higher. All units of leather were sold in... Oh, man. I feel like they keep flubbing these sentences. The local price will be determined by various factors, including supply and demand. 
any particular region on the map may be endowed with significant natural resources or manufacturing hub for specializing for specialized commodity. For example, in a province that is a large producer of leather, then the price would be higher. Uh, all units of would be higher. All units of leather were sold, indicating higher demand. What? Okay, well, let's just assume that it makes sense that the price would be... Uh, if it's a producer of leather, the price should be lower. Um, but, okay, okay. However, significant... Maybe it's higher quality leather and it's more expensive. However, if a significant amount of leather remains unsold in a province, then the price would fall. Okay, so the price just won't end up selling um, and you have to try and transport it down. That sentence is just horribly constructed. Uh, this reflects... Uh, uh, this reflects the... Or I'm just stupid. I don't know. The truth hurts either way, I suppose. This reflects an effect the demand and supply have on price. Each commodity has a base price in the game, which will then be influenced by market forces and trade costs. So, um, we're expecting demand just increases the price of the thing higher and higher. And then um, these uns unsold goods t craters the price. And maybe it's the fact that something that is a specialization can sell at a higher price because it's a higher quality product. I really don't know what they're getting at there. Uh, from the seller's perspective, they seek to minimize added costs arising from tariffs and logistics. Therefore, a seller will usually try to prioritize domestic or short distance trade rather than long distance international trade. Of course, once your logistics networks is robust enough to the point that you long haul logistics costs are low, the world mar market opens up to you. And this is something that'd be nice in Victoria 3 that doesn't really seem to be the case is that you're opening up larger and larger trade volume. Generally speaking in Victoria 3, what ends up happening is that um, trade tends to not get be a very large percentage of your economy basically ever because the result of Mappy interfering with trade at this point now. Uh, Mappy significantly decreases uh, the equilibrium level you'll have in trade and then the auto queue also will uh, build stuff that's going to be more profitable which leads to a situation where you're often not exporting massive amounts of anything. Um, and you can't specialize as hard and so it'd be cool if you could. In game, you can level up your logistics networks and trade routes by lowering tariff rates, upgrading logistics buildings, building railways, and including upgrading state transport. Or perhaps you wish to protect your domestic economy from outside competition. In this case, you can erect trade barriers, big nice, such as uh, higher taxes, embargoes, or trade negotiations. Okay, now we have trade priority. Let's discuss how buyers find the items they want to buy. Since th there is no concept of market process in the game, the players will not directly dictate what goods are sold, where goods are sold. All goods will circulate around the world according to a mechanism we call trade priority. Since trade in Gilded Destiny does not incorporate the market price, uh, process for buyers to haggle on prices, we have created the concept of trade priority. Okay, so this is going to be the nut. Um, trade priority is an in-game mechanic that will dictate which markets first access your goods. Trade priority is relative to each country and determined by your production, economics, geopolitics, uh, and logistics. Generally, buyers within your countries have first access, makes sense, and then buyers based on various factors, namely local prices, logistics, uh, tariffs, and duties, and country ranking. Trade priority of a specific province or country relative to your own sellers will be determined by several factors. First and foremost, by price. The price of a good, uh, when uh, the price of a good with all the added costs included, I assume this is the tariff and transport, uh, will ultimately determine where the commodity is sold. In the event that a final settlement price of an item would be the same for two countries, then the country with a higher ranking will have priority and will receive a chance to buy your goods before the other uh, ranked country. In essence, country ranking will be a tiebreaker. So I assume getting a high country ranking, if it's possible, through geopolitics will be important. Uh, this may mean, in some instances, selling internationally may actually be more lucrative than selling even to a neighboring province, even when taking into account logistics and tariffs. Local prices will vary among your provinces and among foreign provinces with other countries. Uh, the in-game trade system will automatically sell goods where they will earn the most profit. Cool. This may be rare, so you won't be managing trade directly like you do in Victoria 3, it sounds like. This may be rare in practice, however. It highlights the trade system main operating principle. To buy, sell goods at the best price. Yep. In practice, this means that countries with the most logistics, uh, with the most robust logistics network, will be able to send their goods internationally first and at the lowest cost. Therefore, so it, 
I'm guessing this is more a matter of you securing the logistics to make your factories make more money rather than actually building factories, maybe. Therefore, buyers will naturally gravitate towards sellers offering uh, towards sellers offering goods at the lowest cost. As a result, this typically means that buyers and sellers within the stronger within stronger countries will have greater access to goods from the international market, reflecting real-world advantages that military might, uh, robust logistic systems and political strength carry when it comes to trade. Um, the example, champagne production. The Department of the Marne in France is a successful and well-known producer of champagne as a local seller wishes to sell some freshly bottled champagne to the highest bidder. Local price in, made in the barn is five. This represents base price of local demand as there would be no tr significant transport costs. This local price in of champagne in Paris is seven. This represents the base price plus the cost of transporting bottles to buyers in Paris. This also reflects the local demand for champagne is higher uh, as supply is limited since the two provinces. So I, it will keep up pushing up the, tr I'm not sure if it's saying it's pushing up the price until a sufficient supply is achieved. Or if be the, it, there's a local demand in excess of local production, since the two provinces in France they are technically known as departments, yet for consistency we will call them uh, provinces and guild of destiny. Sure, are within the same country. No tariffs are collected. The, uh, the local price of champagne in London is ten dollars, or it's ten dollars, ten dollar. Okay, why is it not in francs? Whatever. I don't know what. Okay, sure. This represents the base price plus the cost of transporting bottles uh, to buyers in London and the amount of customs and tariffs uh, cost con entry into the British Empire. Also, also reflected in this is the local demand, which is also high due to there being no local suppliers of champagne. Okay. Above, we have considered the, pri uh, the purchase price of champagne in various regions, which we still have no idea how exactly the demand is driving the price. Uh, like, they, they're not referring to an equation, but I suppose that's fine. Uh, we have uh, considered the purchase price of champagne in the various regions, which reflect local supply and demand pressures uh, increased due to added costs. Before, we will consider the profit received by the seller when selling in each province. It should be identical, right? It should be equilibrium. Selling within the local province, uh, the champagne producers receive five since there's no logistics or trade costs. Selling to province within the same country but more distant, champagne producers will receive six. Don't they just receive... Uh, isn't it an indifference threshold? Okay, well, whatever. They receive six. This reflects the local price of seven minus logistics costs, which are $1 for the rail transport to Paris, which, since the rails are owned by the state, I assume gets paid to the state. Therefore, by selling to Paris, champagne producers will make a greater profit. Okay. Uh, well, maybe, hmm. I guess they're splitting the extra value, where half gets split to the the... It, well, half the value is going to the infrastructure, and then half is going to oh, half is going to the seller, right? Uh, selling to a province in another country, London, uh, the champagne producers will also receive six dollars. As uh, in the case, the local price ten dollars will include one fifty in tariffs, two fifty in logistics costs, resulting in a total of four dollars of trade costs. Therefore, the champagne producers receive six for selling to London. Okay, they receive the same amount. Uh, in the unique case outlined above, where you are selling to two areas uh, would yield the same price, the area that belongs to the country with the highest global ranking would have access to the commodity, in this case, champagne, first. So your own country would have first access, and so the champagne would go to Paris instead of London. In the present example, champagne would first be... What? In the present example, champagne would be first sold to London, as the seller would receive the highest price. Wait, what? But the, the seller received six. What? You said you said seller receive six, seller receive six. Infer uh, champagne would be so okay. Champagne would be first sold to London as the seller would receive the highest price. Once the buyers in London are satisfied, then buyers in Paris would be able to buy champagne. And finally, uh, any buyer in the department of Marne would have access to buy champagne once the market buyers in Paris are satisfied. That doesn't. I think they meant to make it so that these guys would receive not six, but something like seven or eight. Um, such that the, the, the logistics cost was split, uh, or whatever the logistics plus cost was, was the Marne cost, was half the Marne cost, uh, or was equal to the difference between the Marne cost and the... How, how should I word it? Uh, the logistics 
In this example, you have $1 for logistics and $1 going to the seller. In this example, I was expecting something like $250 going to logistics and $250 going to the seller, so it would sell to the seller for $750. And I think that's maybe what they were trying to say. But the uh, first being sold to London, based on what they've said, if your own country is prioritized first, it should first be sold to France? Okay. Uh, what can you do? As discussed, uh, how trade happens in the game. Now let's discuss how you can influence create trade. Yeah, because you cannot create trade routes yourself, which I think is a better system, but okay. Trade agreements are the intersection of diplomacy and trade. As we will discuss in greater detail in future Dev Dire on Diplomacy, the two countries that signed a trade agreement will attempt to, uh, will exempt each other from all tariffs. Import tariffs and export tariffs on all goods. If used wisely, your people and industries can buy cheaper goods and raw materials, thereby boosting uh, the domestic economy. However, the opposite may occur with uh, in mismatched trade agreements, where your country ends up supporting uh, and benefiting... Uh, supporting and ben uh, benefiting the trade partner without reaping any benefits. Of course, a trade agreement will cost you some tariff revenue. However, the benefits uh, outweigh the uh, disadvantages and the lost revenues will be compensated elsewhere, such as increased trade volume. Spectacular. Um, we see trade agreements, dip diplomatic trade instruments. We see embargo and import duty. Uh, you can use uh, diplomatic instruments uh, against any country, some of which are related to trade, such as adjusting tariffs and embargoes. Adjusting a tariff on another country is, un is not commodity specific. This is probably pretty important. So all goods from that country will be affected by the higher and lower tariffs. So you can't protect individual industries, which would be probably preferable if you could. An embargo, by contrast, can be seen as a harsher trade treatment, directly prohibiting trade, uh, prohibiting all trade with another country. On one hand, an embargo can help you protect domestic industries from cheap foreign industrial products. Uh, this happened, like, with the UK, eventually, like, uh, what was it, in the, like, kind of middle, middling late-ish period of the 1800s, they had, like, a massive uh, deflation from just flooding uh, industrial mark uh, industrial products into the markets yet on the other hand it can prevent domestic goods from always being um, bought by more powerful countries resulting in the needs of your people not being met think of the champagne example it can prevent domestic goods from always being bought by more powerful countries yeah sure so you don't have to let them drink champagne correspondingly other countries may use the same trade related diplomacy against you okay excise and custom duties Consumption tax, uh, consumption, uh, tax and tariff are at the intersection of the trading system and the financial system. Most of the time, by adjusting the settings of these two taxes that are related to the commodities, you can control the macro flow of a commodity. For different commodities, you can decide whether to impose a consumption tax and then adjust the tax uniformly. So you, the whether or not you get to have a uh, consumption tax appears to be binary, and then you adjust the rate for all of these simultaneously. Consumption tax will act on the purchasing behavior of the corresponding commodity in the country. That is to say, the higher the consumption tax, the more difficult it is for the corresponding commodity to be sold in the country, no matter where it comes from. Uh, you can suppress the circulation of a commodity in your country through a consumption tax, ostensibly so you can export it some more. Uh, tariffs only apply to international trade and for each type of good. You can choose one of three tax brackets, uh, priority export, general farm, and priority import. The default option is, to, uh, is the standard tax rate that depends on the trade policy you're currently adopting. For example, under a protection trade policy, the import tariff will be lower than the export tariff. Um, uh, the export, uh, the priority export option will set a high, will set higher export tariffs and lower import tariffs vis-a-vis -vis the normal option. The priority import will set higher import tariffs and lower export tariffs. High import tariffs will prevent other countries from, uh, high import tariffs will prevent uh, goods from other countries from flowing into your country, and high export tariffs will prevent domestically produced goods from flowing to other countries. Okay, that makes sense, I think. I'm not sure if they misworded something. I'm a little suspicious now in general, but okay. We get the idea. You can you can prioritize import, export, etc. National reserves. You can specify uh, to reserve a certain amount of goods in your treasury while building a reserve. Players can specify the amount of goods they want uh, goods to be stocked. Sounds great. And the maximum acceptable purchase price. Uh, once established, the AI will manage the acquisition of goods for the reserve. Once the reserve exceeds the specified amount, the AI will start selling 
Excess goods, the stockpiles goods will be used uh, for some of your country's expenses, such as military supplies, building, buildings, etc. The reserve uh, quantity and acceptable price can be adjusted at any time. And you can, I hope that the price, if you set the price and, and it locally can be purchased for more, that they should just sell off the reserve. Or maybe there's like a certain, I guess you would want it to be a dual price, one you buy at and one you sell at. Okay, it's stock type, trading time. And you can adjust them at any time according to your present needs. The AI will uh, purchase items based on the price of the item in the capital province. So if the price of the, uh, the item in the capital exceeds the maximum acceptable price set, you will not be able to buy the item. This is going to make infrastructure flowing into your capital the most important in the for you entirely. If you're stockpiling everything out from the capital, you will definitely want to make sure that... Um, uh, any infrastructure leading the capital is the most robust, I assume. Furthermore, the option to buy the item when the price is low and sell it after the price increase is also possible. Okay. I think this is the last section here. And then a short little video. <laughs> Finally, a system with a huge amount of information requires a well-designed uh, interface to present enough real-time data or enough data to allow real-time dynamics of trade. In the trade interface, you can view the trade item transactions taking place in your country. You will see several columns for each row, commodity item. We see price. Uh, okay, they're going to tell us. Price, this is the average unit of price in your country, calculated from local price in each province. Demand, this is the total demand in your country, but not all needs can be met. Production, this is the total output in your country. Not I, not all items will be able to find a suitable buyer. Uh, import, this is the quantity of the commodity that your country imports. It may be beneficial to import where there's a large amount of unmet domestic demand. So you it might create a scenarios where you have uh, production that can't find a suitable buyer, but better infrastructure from foreign uh, sellers such that you end up consuming those and you import those rather than consuming the goods that go to waste. That's kind of an interesting thing. It definitely makes sense. Export, this is the amount of your country's exporting the items. It's often advantageous to export after your domestic output is saturated. Unsold, this is the quantity of items produced domestically that remain unsold. And this is an interesting me sounding mechanic. A significant quantity of unsold items will likely cause the domestic price of the item to drop. Seems sensible, and then more will get consumed, right? Okay. Unsatisfied, this is the amount of unmet demand in your country for the item. If buildings cannot buy enough raw materials, uh, then their efficiency will be greatly reduced. Big oof. If, you're, if people cannot buy daily necessities, such as food and clothing, then the happiness will be reduced. You should strive to keep this value as low as possible. Sure. Uh, reserve, this is the amount of you currently have in your national reserves. Okay. So... You can track each column of data, making it easier to understand the situation. Not real-time market data. You can also sort. Okay, cool. Thank you for reading our latest dev diary. If you have any more questions or comments, please let us know on the out uh, on be on be on the lookout for more Gilded Di uh, Dynasty or Destiny dev diaries. Okay, so that was trade. Uh, interesting that it's happening all automatically. I think trade should happen automatically. I think the Victoria 3 system for trade is probably not the best. Um, it does give you some decision points because you can. Uh, use trade to change equilibriums um, and to change prices without needing to build buildings. And so some a lot of the strategy of Victoria 3 goes into the trade system, even though I don't think the trade system is a very good simulation. But that's pretty cool. Uh, pretty much everything when we're talking about Guild of Destiny is going to be being compared to Victoria 3. Uh, next, we have a dev diary that has a vlog. Uh, in this video, we are excited to share some of the initial screenshots of the globe in action. We will also discuss three key design features for Guild of Destiny. City construction, industrial chain development, and military advancement. Each one of these features is being specifically uh, is being developed specifically for the 3D hexagonal globe, which can be fully modified however you like to create your own uh, alternate world, etc., etc. But we're going to view it on the YouTubes. We'll give it a like, too. I guess we'll see. Unlike other GSGs that people are familiar with, in Guild of Destiny, players can freely modify the map with a brush without complex manual editing in text files. Hello everyone, I'm Kenneth, one of the co-founders of Aquila Interactive. I'm an indie game developer and grand strategy game aficionado based in Sweden. I wanted to create a grand strategy game that is a better sandbox that allows further customization with a grander map Better than what, my guy? <laughs> and more details. Gilded Destiny is set at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, allowing players to live through the intricacies and challenges of the era, cool which lay the foundations of the modern world. The game's central goal is to transform your chosen country from an agrarian society into an industrial one. 
where you will lead your population from subsistence to wealth. By the map look, the map looks dope and doesn't seem to be lagging. By controlling key economic, diplomatic, military factors to achieve your goal. Of course, since this is a sandbox game after all, you can do whatever tickles your fancy, no matter how ridiculous. Whether it's attempting to industrialize the Qing Dynasty in the 1800s or conquering the world with the mighty Empire of Luxembourg. Oh, it's is Inuit impossible. playable? So, based on these. Alright, let's see here. The rankings, the starting rankings on the country list that they have so far is UK first, France, uh, then, uh, what is that? Bavarian Empire is third? Wait, what? That must be Russian Empire. What are we doing with our life? Can we, yeah, let's. Okay. <laughs> Apologies to everyone that I made you watch it <laughs> a little bit of lower, uh, lower HD. Let's actually take back the map. Yeah, I mean, he's too zoomed out of right here. But, Mind a partner. but we have uh, the Russian Empire, the Austrian Empire, Kingdom of Prussia, Spain. Spain ahead of the US, uh, then the Ottoman Empire, Sweden, Norway, Portugal, Great Qing, Persia, Afghanistan, Denmark, Siam, Mexico. Chris and I set out the defining features for Gilded Destiny. First, although it used hex tiles that may resemble what you see in games like Civilization or Humankind, the yep. tiles in Gilded Destiny are projected onto a spherical Earth. More importantly, it is a real-time strategy game, not the turn basement. The map has about 1.6 million tiles, making the terrain more detailed. So, uh, initially when I was evaluating this, I thought it was like 1.7 million tiles that you would interact with, but if 70% of these are ocean tiles, I guess you could put a boat in them, but they're not keeping track of buildings. And more pops. players, more room for customization. We mainly went with the hex tiles because we wanted to make it very easy for anyone to modify or make a map without special knowledge. Furthermore, to make achieving the next defining feature possible. The second defining feature is resource management and building placement. Where you place your structures in your city can have a significant impact and produce complementary effects on surrounding structures. So I definitely think that this is cool, but like this is like, grand, I think grand strategy, and I thought about this a little bit, um, I think grand strategy is like distinct from city building, and this is like a city building mechanic, and it will just like, I think, I'm concerned that this just leads to like micromanagement hell and like it just taking forever to play a year in order to play it properly. If you have to like uh, super, super tease out the proper details of how stuff should be placed. That is, buildings can interact and become more efficient through bonus buffs based on their placement. Unlike your typical GSG today, terrains will play a vital role. For example, the fertility of the tiles will have a sizable impact on what you can grow or graze. Additionally, this looks super various dope. terrain types will hinder the speed of your military deployment, thereby requiring additional tactical considerations. Finally, terrains can also play a vital role in your logistics. It's a little bit concerning that I don't think he has anything going on here in this thing, and it seems to be laggy. Finally, terrains can also play a vital role in your logistics. Like, I think that lagging is on his end. Maybe it's on the recording end, but if there's already not a bunch of entities or pops placed or like something like this, and it's keeping like your economy choppy, running, your people fed, and military supply, players will need to think and plan how to efficiently extract resources and transport them to designated locations for processing and consumption through their logistics network, such as. Yeah, once you get super moved, it's like zoomed out, it's smooth, but like any amount zoomed in, train, it's choppy. Ships and etc. Of course, neither of the defining features mentioned above can be achieved without a deep simulation of the population. Therefore, to highlight the importance of population, we have a mechanism for population migration. Policies and industrialization progress will heavily impact how people migrate from place to place. However, stay tuned for more details on the migration feature of the game. We'll cover this in yeah, more depth. I think it's more showing While up While your map. country is developing rapidly, there can be a series of situations, such as an economic surplus, where you will need to dump products onto foreign markets, or conversely, shortages where you would have to come up with raw materials. Specifically, like, Great Britain imported a ton of raw materials and exported a bunch of, like, industrial products, especially in the early 1800s. Somehow. In either of those examples, you would need to have contingencies in place. One of those contingencies, though, might be war. The third defining feature of Gilded Destiny... Just like everything 
Yeah, okay, let's continue. And specifically, your control over the battlefield. During critical moments in a battle, you can control various military units in real time and secure victory through superior tactics. I honestly, uh, one of the things that really drew me to Victoria 3 initially was that military would be hands off because as a player, I want to outsmart the AI in terms of economics and not in terms of military and micro. And so the more hands on the military is, the more that this is an important factor. So for me, this is a drawback, but I, I see most often people complaining about lack of control of military units in Victoria 3. What technologies make devastating and exciting progress through the Industrial Revolution, and it should not be oversimplified into a mere progress bar. The great <laughs> Prussian general and military theorist Karl von Kaltzwitz once said, War is politics by other means. That is, sometimes unresolvable territorial or economic disputes happen, and war is the only solution. There are many factors that can influence... That that quote seems like out of place there. I think he just wanted to put it. I think he wanted to throw out the Clausewitz quote. It's the outcome of a war. In the early stages of the Industrial Revolution, the logistic supply lines provided by rail were the key. As we mentioned earlier, when building cities, logistics will be a crucial element in the development of your nation. I, I think and equally important. I think if the emphasis is on logistics, like more than other stuff, because trade is hands off. Um, like in terms of player attention, that'd be super neat if it's like, uh, like a logistics manager, but then like, I, I'm concerned about the city builder manager aspect. As well. Smooth logistics supply lines and a reliable industrial chain will help you become another empire, which the sun never sets. The three points mentioned above, city construction, industrial chain development, and military advancement, all rely on- Yeah, but look at this lag, man. Logistics. In this world of nothing's built, this is just like baseline. 1.6 million tons, creating a physical global logistic mechanism and giving practical significance to railway and sea routes on the map is an important goal for us, setting Gilded Destiny apart from other grand strategy games. Now that we have mentioned key aspects of the game itself, it is important to emphasize another factor that is not part of the game but was a crucial initial goal for the entire project. Gilded Destiny is meant to be a sandbox game that players can deeply customize as they desire. From opting for hexagons instead of shaped provinces to having a built-in editor, all came from the intentions that players must be able to easily modify and add content and then share it with others through the Steam Workshop. Oh man, Unlike we Unlike other GSGs support, yeah. that people are familiar with, in Gilded Destiny, players can freely modify the map with a brush without complex manual editing in text files. Maybe you feel that our map is not detailed enough and you want to make a better one. This is super cool. Or perhaps you want to create a fictional world. Both of these goals can be easily achievable. All the settings in the game, such as national province borders, population and cities, can be modified through our game editor. Okay, that's all I will say in this dev diary. We are aiming to release a close alpha test towards the end of this year. If you are interested, remember to search Gilded Destiny on Steam and add it to your wish list. Okay. So that's pretty cool. The, the, I mean, I am concerned about... Defining features. Talk about defining features. Where you I'm concerned about the level of lag. Make interact and become but fit. this is, this for me is probably an area where I'm just like a little bit leery. It's like... The, the grand strategy, right, is a little bit divorced from the city builder, in my opinion, and I don't know if I want the two together in a game. Like, I would want to play, like, Anno 1800 and then also Victoria 3 and, like, keep those separate, um, I think. But also, like, um, the more time you sink into a game, the more you wish you could do other stuff. Like, I wish I could do additional stuff in Victoria 3, but that's only because I have over 2,000 hours in Victoria 3, right? And so it's, like, it's just some more interesting stuff to play with. Uh, but, like, just designing it from the ground up eventually it becomes such that it's just overwhelming. Like, if you've never touched EU4 and you try and play it, like, with all the various mechanics, it's, like, a lot to take in. Um, I guess Victoria 3 is kind of a bit to take in now, but, um... Yeah, I don't know. This is interesting. Uh, so we're, it, it, again, if, if you guys stay interested and you keep wanting to see kind of updates on this, this will be interesting. 
Um, overall, uh, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than I was at the end of the last series of three that we kind of uh, take a look at. Uh, I really like the logistics stuff. Uh, I think that the game's pretty ambitious. The fact that he's lagging while zipping I like around, other, no, the term uh, you know, yeah. is for me like a little bit of a subject of concern. Like if he's zoomed in at all, he's lagging when he's like moving around, and like there's not there's not a bunch of armies on the map yet. There's not a bunch of like uh, there's not a bunch of stuff on the map yet. You know what I mean? Uh, for this guy. Mission through bonus. And it's already, it, like, it looks choppy. And to be fair, it's, like, not optimized, but, like, the performance should just get worse. So this is, like, a bit of a concern for me that they're just trying to, uh, they're trying to take a wish list of everything they want to put in. And they're, like, we're putting it in there. And then, like, um, what's the core gameplay loop supposed to be? And it's, like, it's an open sandbox. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, we'll continue going through these again if you guys are still interested. Uh, in the various dev diaries. Um, if you like this, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, do the YouTube algorithm thing, and other than that, have a good one.